Welcome to the Classics and Immunology Journal Club. Presently, we're already up to 1998, if you can believe it or not, starting in 1798, a while back before COVID. Today, we're going to talk about a uh, one of the very classic papers uh, coming from uh, Rafi Ahmed's lab down at Emory University in Atlanta. And before we get started, don't forget to like the video on the YouTube channel and click on the bell and get notified for the next ones and subscribe and check out, scroll down, check out my website, kendallasmith.com and click on the writing tab. And you'll find all the classic papers of immunology there. So today the paper is from Immunity in February, published in February of 1998. And it is entitled Counting Antigen-Specific CDA-Positive T-Cells, a Reevaluation of the Byst of Bystander Activation During Viral Infection. The authors are Kaja Mirali Krishna, John Altman, several others, and the senior author is Rafi Ahmed, who's a good friend of mine. The background of this paper, I should, I should mention there's two other papers from 1998 from other labs that basically say the same thing that this paper does. Um, Rafi Ahmed was a, um, a young um, immunologist in training with Michael Oldstone, who um, was at the Scripps Institute in La Jolla, California, who was one of the pioneers of, of uh, using the LCM V virus, lymphocytic choreomeningitis virus in mice to study the, um, the virology and the immunology of this particular infection. And Rafi learned the, the nitty gritty, the methods from Mike Goldstone. John Altman, one of the other authors, was a young fellow who had uh, developed a new technique to, uh, to enumerate antigen-specific T-cells, peptide-specific T-cells, wow. using the flow cytometer, and it's called a it was called MHC, is called MHC tetramer analysis. Tetramers, they, they painstakingly uh, tried to see whether or not they could develop MHC molecules loaded with peptides, specific peptides, to see if they would uh, stick to T-cell clones, antigen-specific T-cell clones, and so that they could then use the flow cytometer to um, count them and also find out how many T cell receptor molecules were on the cell surface and so forth. They found that when they went, they couldn't do it with, with a single MHC molecule peptide complex or, or two or three, but when they got to four, and this is why we call them tetramers, then they, they would stick and with a high enough affinity so that they didn't come off in the process of uh, getting the cells ready to, to examine by the flow cytometer. And uh, now up until this time, the only way to really enumerate within a population of T cells was a method called limiting dilution and analysis. And in this particular instance, what you would do is, is that you'd make multiple dilutions uh, of your T cells and you would culture them in micro titer plates with a specific peptide and also add interleukin-2 in. You'd culture those plates for as long as 10 days and you would then harvest those plates and you could then test them for um, immunologic function. One test uh, turned out to be um, looking for interferon gamma production. Two methods were devised to do that. One was called Ellie spot and I'll go into them how they go about that. And the other one was intracellular cytokine staining. It was found that if you used inhibitors of, um, of secretion or the, the internal cytokine. And most people, you, you could use any, you could look at interleukin-2 and so forth. People were in viral infections were particularly interested in interferon gamma. Um, you could also, at the end of 10 days, harvest those whatever cells uh, were in the, uh, the wells and, and assay them for lymphocyte-mediated cytotoxicity. And those, those are the two different kinds of assays, either cytokine secretion by Ellie spot or by intracellular cytokine staining, and then uh, cytotoxicity. Now, during doing that, they found that there was an awful lot of cells in, in animals that had been infected and or immunized with uh, different viruses, but most of those cells did not, were not functional. And uh, they looked like they were, they were proliferating, in these wells over that 10 day time period, but, but they didn't, they weren't making interferon gamma when they were reactivated and they couldn't kill. 
in this particular paper, the materials and methods uh, that were used is, so that was the background. Uh, and the materials and methods, wait, before I get to that, I better get, well, with, with the new, in the introduction, they go into the whole thing of, of saying that um, now that they had these new techniques, tetramer analysis on the one hand and intracellular cytokine staining and, and, and so forth, they re-looked at this uh, idea that um, the majority, and, the, and this was the dogma, the majority of cells were, were not antigen specific because they couldn't show antigen specific function. And the materials and methods that they used in this particular paper, they used uh, two different strains of mice, the Balb C mouse, and the other strain that they used was the C57 Black 6 mouse. They would infect these mice um, in a primary infection with two times 10 to the fifth uh, LCMV uh, viral particles. Mm -hmm intraperitoneally for the primary infection. And then if they wanted to do a secondary in infection, they would do, or a, a boost kind of thing, they would use tenfold higher virus concentration, two times 10, 10 to the sixth, and they'd give that, um, uh, that dose intravenously. Uh, they also, as a control, used vaccinia virus, two times 10 to two million viral particles, and they gave, gave that intraperitoneally. Now for the Ellis spot, they would, the way you would do that was you take these microtiter plates and you would coat them with rat, rat anti-mouse interferon gamma, and you could then uh, wash off the excess and so forth. And then you would add responder cells, plus the antigenic peptide you're interested in, plus interleukin-2, and you culture those, culture those plates for um, 36 hours, day and a half, that's not too bad, at least not 10 days, right? Um, and then you could um, take those cells and add biotinylated anti-mouse interferon gamma and then add substrate that would react to the biotinylation. And then you could get the percentage of positive wells and the percentage of positive cells and the lower limit of detection in that whole thing was, only, it was 10 spots per million uh, cells, essentially. In the, in the intracellular uh, flow cytometry staining for interferon gamma, it was only a five hour assay. So it wasn't a 36 hour assay. And you take a million cells in a well, uh, add interleukin-2 plus brafeldin A, plus or minus then the antigen, the, the CTL epitope that you're interested in. And then you could then harvest those cells after five hours and, and go on to the flow cytometer and look for intracellular cytokine uh, positivity uh, using a fluorescein um, conjugated uh, anti-interferon gamma, usually in this particular instance was what they did. The, the tetramer analysis was the other uh, new technique that they used in this paper. Uh, and that, um, they didn't detail the methods and I didn't go into them, but they were in a previous science paper uh, from 1996, just a uh, couple of years before this paper. So in, in the results, and now we'll go into screen sharing, results are quite, quite dramatic. This is figure one. Uh, and this, this emphasizes the, uh, the size of the virus-specific CD, CDA-positive T-cell response. Mm -hmm. And the high frequency, the, the surprise in this, that this figure depicts was the high frequency of virus-specific CD8 positive T cells. Uh, in A, you're looking at either LA spot uh, in the open circles and, and or uh, intracellular cytokine staining in the open triangles. And so what we have, uh, we have for in, in the A part, we have in the left-hand portion of this uh, figure is, the C57 black six mice, and in the right-hand portion, the BALB C mice. Down here in the abscissa, we have different peptides. This is a nuclear protein peptide, a uh, certain number, glycopep glycoprotein, and, and, and so forth here. So there's several different peptides that had already been uh, determined that were immunodominant uh, dominant peptides. And you can see this is the percent of LCMV-specific CD8-positive T cells and you can, here we got an average, which is in the solid circles, of around 35% of all the T cells were this were reacting to this particular peptide. And here we've got about 25% uh, 
reacting to this particular peptide, not so much these. Um, and in the B6, or I mean in the valve C, we have almost 45% here uh, with this particular peptide, uh, and, and it was negative for these two peptides. So in the, in the B portion uh, of this uh, figure, we have now in, interferon gamma uh, in intercellular staining. So this is flow cytometry of the cell number on the, on the ordinate and um, CD8 positive uh, T cells uh, on the surface. And you can see no peptide. There's very few positive interferon gamma positive cells. Whereas with this particular uh, nuclear protein, this is in the Balb C mouse, and this is this particular peptide, you can 50% 50, 50 of them were positive. Whereas low, very low numbers. And here's the isotope, isotype control. There's nothing going on here. And here in the B6, you see no peptide here. And then this particular nuclear protein, which is this one, 28%, 19% on this peptide, 7%. So if you add all these up, then you get to a very high proportion of cells that are, that are at peptide specific. Um, and they're all activated um, by, determined by the expression of CD44 uh, on the cell surface. This is the no peptide control. And here is the B6 with this particular peptide. And uh, you can see how uh, positive that, that whole thing is. And then in figure two, figure two is the visualization of virus specific CD8 positive T cell by tetramer staining. Here you can see, um, and this is on day eight after the infection. And this is the particular tetramer. And as many as, 23% were positive in this particular experiment. Uh, and here in the BALB C, you see 56% positive here. Um, and in, in B is a, a tetramer staining on the ordinate. And on the abscissa, you have B, BRDU, bromodeoxyuridine incorporation into newly uh, synthesized DNA. And you can see that these cells are, that are positive by the tetramer stain are all proliferating essentially. That, that they say in the text was direct proof that these cells are, are accumulating in vivo because they're proliferating. Now in figure three here on the right-hand side here, we, we see the, the isolation of a pure population of antigen specific CD8 positive T cells by sorting on the, on the fluorescence activated cell sorter uh, tetra, uh, tetra positive cells. And here they're looking at the number of sorted tetra, tetramer positive cells that had been stimulated. And you can see uh, what a uh, marked increase they are in antigen specific cells. And then this is the ex vivo cytotoxic T lymphocyte capacity of these cells. And so we're talking about talking about a huge number of antigen specific cells in here. And then in figure four is the quantification and visualization of antigen specific memory CD8 positive T cells after the infection in, in multiple days over a year time period. And so in A, we have the Balb C mice, uh, mouse, and in B, we have C7 black six mice. And these are the epitope specific CD8 positive T cells per, per spleen. And this is days of uh, post-infection. So there's a marked expansion that occurs over the first eight days so that as many as half of the cells are responding to this particular peptide um, in, in this instance. Whereas um, there was much fewer uh, responding to this particular peptide. The other thing that happens then is in the sort of in the second week from eight, day eight to 15, there is a marked fall off so that you lose about 90% of the, uh, of the um, antigen specific cells that, are, that proliferated in the expansion phase, but then they persist for, a next, for the next year, essentially at same frequency and same way with this peptide here. And if you, you look down at um, the B6, peptide-specific cells is the same phenomenon. That 
essentially is what I wanted to tell you. So that there's, so that they said that well, there's three phases here. There's activation and, and expansion on days one to eight. There's death between days eight to thirty, where you lose ninety to ninety-five percent of the cells that had expanded, and then you had you end up with an expanded memory population of cells after day thirty. 30th, and that can uh, persist for up to a year. So they also did other experiments. They challenged uh, the immunized mice or the infected mice, um, not with LCMV for a secondary infection, but rather with a primary infection of vaccinia virus. Uh, and vaccinia virus did nothing to the, um, uh, to the LCMV specific peptide uh, induced cells. So we'll stop screen sharing at that point and go on to the discussion in this paper. And in the discussion, they make several um, points. The first is <clears throat> that the size of the antiviral response is much, was much greater than anyone had an inkling before. And, and so that was really revolutionary in this business. And as, as many in, in terms of the peptides that they had for each strain of mouse and so forth, the, they, they said up to 70% of the, of the cells were peptide specific, but really the, it was none, it was 100%. Of those cells that expanded that, um, uh, that could be marked were antigen specific cells. So that now they realize that the limiting dilution analysis had underestimated the number of <clears throat> antigen specific cells by greater than 90 percent and the the question is why was that and the, you know they speculate or they they discuss that in the discussion that the some of them must have been lost by by activation induced cell death which was a phenomenon that was clearly established mm -hmm. and so that the, the cells might not grow for this 10 days of this limiting dilution analysis uh, and the other thing was is that they could their endpoint for the for the LDA was cytotoxicity and so if they didn't kill for whatever reason and we will get into that a little bit later mm -hmm. they couldn't be marked as antigen specific so that this the limiting dilution analysis uh, left a lot to be desired. We go on to discuss that, you know, so, okay, this is in the mouse and this is with this particular virus, LCMV. What about the uh, human? And so they said that it's been well known for a long time that in herpes simplex uh, infections and in uh, Epstein-Barr virus infections, that there's, uh, of um, so a, those are large DNA viruses there is a huge expansion of uh, antigen-specific CD8 positive T cells, and that was those are the cells that were marked um, uh, seen in the peripheral blood of patients with infectious mononucleosis that were infected with EB virus, and and so the same kinds of things had been shown subsequently in um, HTLV1 infection, uh, the human T leukemia virus, and also in HIV, there is marked expansion of CD8 positive antigen specific T cells. So this is not just, you know, experimental immunologists doing pie in the, pie in the sky kinds of um, experiments. And of course, in this day and age of COVID infection, <laughs> the same thing happens there's a marked expansion of cytotoxic T cells, CD8 positive cytotoxic T cells that occurs uh, in this whole thing. Now, and so that's relevant. Uh, and and the, the cytotoxic T cells that are, that are being generated in COVID infection also make interferon. And interferon is one of the major cytokines that, that um, is antiviral and that causes um, uh, or uh, inhibits the spread of the, of the virus. Now, the question was, after seeing these data, the question is why, why <laughs> after this peak expansion that only takes a week, why do, why do you know, 90% of them die off in the second week? And they would leave behind uh, long-term memory C, T cells on, a, on the order of about 5%, so that if you re-immunize these mice, you would then get another bump up and then another uh, diminution. And then a, you could bump up the number of, of um, mem memory T cells. 
which is why we do that in uh, the COVID immunization scheme. Um, the other, the most important, I guess, or one of the most important conclusions from these experiments was is that the whole idea that there are innocent bystanders being expanded by these dirty old lymphokines, cytokines, you know, causing uh, nonspecific proliferation and all this other stuff was just not true. Those cells were being antigen selected, and just like Sir McFarlane uh, Burnett told us. And they were being, we thought, I thought, expanded because they were making interleukin-2 and responding to interleukin-2. And that was an interleukin-2 driven phenomenon. So when I saw this paper, or when I read this paper, I got together with uh, Rafi Ahmed. He had come to New York where I was, and we went out to dinner. And I proposed to him that we do a collaborative experiment or series of collaborative experiments that we did. And we found, we published a paper in Nature um, Medicine in 2003. And one of Rafi's um, students at the time, Joe Blattman, was, was um, the uh, primary person who did all of these experiments. And what Joe found was that if he treated the mice in the first eight days after the infection, it did nothing to the, to the number of cells that were expanded, either plus or minus, which was important because um, th there was data being accumulated um, uh, during this time period that, that would indicate that maybe IL-2 was some negative feedback uh, signal given to these cells and was detrimental to the proliferation of these cells. Clearly not the case in Joe's experiments. But what was even more dramatic uh, was is that if they waited for the second week when you got this marked contraction, part of the whole thing, it would maintain the cells so high. And it would maintain the cells as long as you continue to give them uh, interleukin-2. Uh, and, and so that's what I had anticipated, that the reason that they had this so-called contraction phase is they ran out of IL. They outstripped the ability to produce enough IL-2 to keep them together, which of course has therapeutic implications for interleukin-2 therapy, because if you can prevent the, um, the contraction phase, in, let's say in an immunization, you can end up with more memory T cells. And if you're treating uh, an infection and you can prevent the contraction phase, that should be all well and good for man and God and whatever. The thing is, during this, after, after these papers were published, not only Peter Doherty's group in Australia uh, did exactly the same kinds of experiments with the influenza virus and found exactly the same kind of thing. Mike Bevan uh, in Seattle uh, also used LCMB, but he found very similar data. So there were three papers out, all in immunity, two in February and one in June uh, of uh, 1998 that all said the same thing. Most, if not all, of the so-called uh, T-cell receptor immunologists just sort of figured, well, the antigen's causing those cells to proliferate. They, did, they didn't really, I don't think they really read Joe Blattman's paper where we showed that if you give them IL-2, they won't, they won't contract. And then there was a nice paper from um, Aaron West, who was a, a student in Rafi Ahmed's lab, who did a series of experiments and published them uh, in the journal Clinical Investigation in, in 2013, where she looked at the combination of low-dose IL-2 therapy together with anti-PD-1, one of the uh, co-inhibitors of the T-cell uh, response, and found that they were synergistic um, um, together, and that the combination of IL-2 plus anti-PD-1 uh, was antiviral uh, than either IL-2 or PD anti-PD-1 alone. They were synergistic in terms of uh, decreasing the um, replication of the virus. So that's sort of where we are in, in terms of experimental work done in, the, um, in viral immune reactions. These same kinds of things I have not seen um, published yet in um, the coronavirus COVID uh, era, but I anticipate uh, that we will be seeing more about T cells going forward. 
So that's it for this particular uh, episode. And don't forget to like the video and click on the bell and subscribe. Check out the website and uh, come back for more next week. Thank you. So the other thing is, you can read all about these kinds of things in a very succinct mm -hmm. manner that, uh, that I published in my book, Molecular Immunity. Here it is. And that was published in uh, 2019, 1819. So it's pretty much up to date. And the, it includes uh, a very nice uh, historical approach to the whole thing. And that's why the subtitle of this book is a chronology of 60 years of discovery. And so uh, I recommend it highly. It could also help my retirement fund. Thanks a lot.